Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. My name is Todd Rothman, and in this video, we're going to learn about more details about the chemical shift. We're going to understand what functional groups or other kind of similar ideas or influences uh, that H's would have around it to change its location on a chart. So we're going to figure out exactly what the trends are that allow us to determine where an H should be within a chart. Like So in other words, when you do this resonation or when you do a spin flip, uh, where would it show up on our diagram? And that's what we're going to learn about now. But before we do that, I want to do a quick review of certain things and actually add a little bit more to the chart itself because we're about to start digging a little bit deeper into the chart. So I just want to make sure that these points are clear for us. All right. So that's what we're going to start with. Now, again, let me emphasize that this is HNMR. We're dealing with HNMR. It's always good to start with one and HNMR is the most popular. Once you get all the details from HNMR, it's very easy actually to learn the other ones. So we'll probably talk a little bit about CNMR, but you'll find that it's much easier to learn once you have HNMR down. So HNMR is where you learn everything and then everything else kind of falls in. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, again, like I mentioned, I have listed out here just the you know some of the key points and I want to add a little bit more to it. Now, the first thing I want to emphasize is again, TMS, is what we use in order to kind of calibrate our chart because everything in organic chemistry, not everything, but most things in organic chemistry will fall to the left side of TMS. So things don't tend to go on the right side of it. Now, sometimes you'll get readings on the right side, but it's not as frequent. So almost all the molecules that we deal with, they read after the TMS mark. So that's why we call this zero. Now, since this is HNMR, right here is 12, right? This is for HNMR. And so what this means is that TMS is the most defended, meaning its local magnetic field for the hydrogens are the most shielded, and so it defends off the big magnet the most, right? Remember, we have this big applied magnet that we're putting around it. And so this is the most shielded. Remember, shield is protecting it or of opposing the applied magnet magnetic field, right? And then as you go downfield, or you become more de-shielded, okay? That means you're not defending as much. Now, as far as energy, let's think about that. So what, when we talked about our general philosophy of NMR, we thought about changing the magnetism, and we saw how keeping the radio frequency fixed and how you adjust the magnetism to make it resonate. But remember that modern techniques do the opposite, right? So we have a fixed magnetic strength or field, applied magnetic field, and we change the frequency. So we're doing the opposite. So it turns out that the trend is that the more de-shielded you are, so as you go downfield, that's increasing in energy. This is where energy is increasing, right? That means frequency is increasing right? So the further downfield that you are relative to TMS, the more energy is going to be required to get them to resonate, okay? So that's the first thing I want to make sure is very clear here, because think about it. Now, let's say we do a, a thought experiment, okay? And by the way, I wrote here, less shielded than the more energy to, split, to spin flip it, and that's what I'm showing you in that right there. So let's do a little thought experiment, again, with HA and HB. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to have not the magnetism change, we're going to change the frequency. So we know that if we have 7 Tesla, if that's our magnetic strength, if this is our applied magnet, it equals 7 Tesla, right? Then we should have a 300 megahertz um, for the radio frequency, right? For radio frequency. So this is what we know. Okay, and it's just something that you don't have to memorize. It's just, uh, you know, I've said it a few times now, and so hopefully it's becoming clear. Now, let's think about how this would work if we had a fixed magnetism. So if this was fixed, how would this work? So, again, we want to think about in terms of we know the number we must reach. We have to hit 7. And 7 is the magnetic strength that we're expecting to hit. Now, if we have a applied magnetic field and a local magnetic field and we think about what happens if the applied is at 7, remember this is fixed, right? 
and the local is what's different. Remember from before I said this is, let's say, and these are just imaginary numbers, but let's say it's one Tesla. It's not one Tesla. I mean, we're talking about very small defenses. I don't think I made that clear in the previous video, but one Tesla is gigantic. This is, it's a much smaller number, but it's easy to see it if we use, you know, bigger numbers. So, and this is 0 0.5 Tesla, right? These are our um, results here. Remember what we did? We subtract them from each other. So this is actually six. The effective of our magnetic strength here is six, and here it's 6.5, right? That's what actually is resulting from this. So again, think about what's happening. I want you to connect with this detail. So you have this local field, and it's going to fight off the big magnet. The stronger the local, the better it fights it off. So the more it's going to deduct from the actual magnet around it. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, what I showed you earlier was when we deal with an adjustment of magnetic strength. But what if we don't change the magnet, right? What if we're not changing the strength of the magnet? Instead, we're changing the frequency. So think about that. So do you remember the rule the, or the general idea? When we have a certain magnetic strength, there's a certain match for frequency. If you increase one, you have to increase the other. If you decrease one, you decrease the other, right? So think about this. If these two, if in general, our standard is at 300 megahertz, then at 7 Tesla, then you know it goes to resonance at hydrogen, right? But neither one of these are actually feeling 7. This one is 6.5, and this is uh, 6 and 6.5, right? So neither one of them are going to actually require 300 megahertz. So if I start at 0 megahertz, I have the machine off, the radio frequency is off, and I turn it on. As I get close to 300, who do you think is going to resonate first? Is it going to be the one that's more or less shielded? Think about it. This one here is more shielded, and this is less shielded, right? And think about the effect of this. So the lower the number, then the less energy required to get it to resonate, right? So HA is going to require less energy to resonate, right? To go through this spin flip. Why? Because its actual feeling, the effectiveness of this big magnet is smaller number. It's six. So that means that as you're going from zero and you're going up towards 300 megahertz, the first one to resonate is going to be the HA because it doesn't require as much energy. The separation between the alpha and beta is not as large. Remember, the, the more effective, the more the stronger that magnet, the better the separation of alpha or the beta. But if it's less effective, then it's going to be closer together alpha and beta. So as you can see, what's happening is as I go from zero up to 300, I don't know the exact number, but when you get close to 300, the first one that's going to resonate is HA. And then you go turning a little bit more, and then you hit HB. See that? So HA requires less energy, and HB requires more. So you see how we flipped this just now? I want you to think about what I just explained to you, because there are always two ways to look at it, and you need to understand both. To be quite honest, you don't know which way they can ask you a question about this, if they even do at all. But one way is they can have you adjust the magnetic strength, and the other way is they have you adjust the radio frequency. And so you have to think about it in terms of what's happening on a logical way. So here's the story. The stronger the magnet, the more energy you need. That's it. Weaker the magnet or the effectiveness of the magnet, right? Think about it from the effectiveness. The weaker the effectiveness of the magnet, then the weaker or less energy required. And that's how you work this logic. Okay? So make sure this is clear. And now let's go back to this idea up here. So when you're looking at a chart, the one that's less shielded is going to require more energy because the gap between alpha and beta is larger, right? Because remember, if it's less shielded, then that means it doesn't defend itself as much, and so the effectiveness is larger. The B effective is going to be larger if it's less shielded. And so that's why the ones that are shielded don't require as much energy, okay? So that's what I want you to...